Hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of This Racing Live. And with the start of the flat season comes the beginning of sales season. Malcolm Bastard, well he's got plenty of bullets to fire. At the upcoming Breeze Ups, we're here to find out a little bit more. Here's what else is coming up. Obviously, I've got a soft spot for too darn hot. I might be looking through rose tinted glasses because we had him here and we've got enough of them to make a fair assessment and they look way above average. With Royal Acclaim, we, we knew that we had a very nice animal. I remember standing at the top of the Royal Mile there, watching them breeze and watching her through the binoculars and then sort of putting the binoculars down and going, geez, that looks, that looks pretty quick. Looking back on it, it, it doesn't seem real because, because we're working so hard, you don't get the time to sort of take a breath and go, wow, that just happened. There are a few names more synonymous with pre-training and consigning for the Breeze Ups than Malcolm Bastard. We paid a visit to his base in Wiltshire to find out how it all began. I was always mad keen on horses from when I was five or six, but never started riding until I was nine on a few hunters in our local village. Uh, then when I was 12, um, I worked weekends for a guy called Percy Evans, who was a very good flat jockey in his day. He was retained, he was second jockey to, um, to Lord Derby. Well, he was his lightweight jockey. And he trained privately at Brooksby Grange, which is uh, near Melton Mowbray, about six miles from where I used to uh, live. And I used to work there at weekends for a pound. And I used to have to run there and back four times each weekend. Um, but I just, just love horses, they've been my life. Um, and they've been very good to me and uh, I hope I'm good to them. From there on, it was moving on to Fred Winter, a, a hotbed of talent. What did you learn there that maybe wouldn't have been accessible in other racing yards up and down the country? Well, I, I don't know about other racing yards, but I mean, he, it was just an amazing place. Um, I was, had no confidence with Mr. Winter, he frightened me, to be honest with you. <laughs> But um, Brian Delaney, was just, uh, who was the head lad, he was just amazing, the way that the horses were looked after um, and, and, and the way he went about his daily work with them. Um, and you just learnt an immense amount off of him. People talk about the attention to detail, the, the regimented process that would happen at Fred Winters. Was that something you carried forward into your current base of work? I'll try to. Yeah, it's very difficult to have standards as high as that, but, you know, I try my best, absolutely. You rode for, for many years. I think you said you were there for six, seven, eight years. That must have been a particularly... Well, it must have been an amazing time, given it was the heyday of Fred Winter. I, I, it was brilliant, but looking back, I probably didn't make the most of my opportunities because I was nervous all the time. I didn't want to let anybody down. But uh, my first year there, I looked after a very good horse that... that um, called The Dealer, and he won 13 out of 15 races for us. And Jimmy Guest, who works with me now, does most of the breaking. He, he rode in the first time he won at Newbury. Um, John Franken was in America, I think, riding in the Colonial Cup. And uh, he started at 50 to 1 at Newbury, which is unheard of of, of any of the, the horses out from Uplands at the time. Um, and he absolutely bolted up. He was a very good horse. and. Um, obviously learnt a lot after looking after him. And he was a pleasure to look after. All horses are a pleasure to look after. So after hanging up your riding boots, what was next? What was the immediate decision that you thought, I need to make a living here, what am I gonna do? Well, I was struggling and towards the end I wasn't getting very many rides and I was very friendly with, um, who was a very good jockey, extremely good jockey, a guy called Ronnie O'Leary, who was uh, riding for Jimmy Fitzgerald at the time. And he told me that he'd previous, the previous year he'd uh, had a yearling and prepared it for the breeze up sales. So um, I thought I'd have a go at it myself. So I did. And here we are, 33 <laughs> years later. <laughs> it, it's amazing. The longevity you've had in the breeze up game in pre-training in pre as well. We've had a look at some awesome facilities today, but it wasn't always like that. No, crikey. Uh, <laughs> A few of the first horses I had, I mean, they, <laughs> one of them was kept in the coal shed, actually, but it belonged to me, so it was no one else's. But no, we've, as we've done well, we've tried to improve the facilities, which is better for the horses, and uh, yeah, we'll keep trying to improve them also, you know, in the future. It's an industry that 
plenty of us won't really know anything about. One thing that's always fascinated me is the actual breaking in of a horse. Could you just talk me through the process of how exactly you'd go about it? Yeah, well, it's, it's not a difficult thing, that's for sure, uh, uh, as long as you've got reasonable facilities and you're, you're quiet and confident with them. I mean, generally speaking, whether they come in from the sales and the horses are well handled that have been to the sales and some of them have had a um, tack on them, a roller on them and side reins to get a bit of shape into them, to give them a top line for the sales. Um, we, we, we have a good few that come in from, from the sales and we also have um, quite a lot that just come in out of the field. There's not too much difference with, with the way we um, approach either of them. Just get the horse's confidence for a start. Um, we'll make sure that they're handled properly in the stables um, and they learn some manners in the stables, moving over, um, being able to tie up, simple things like that. Um, and then we would start them off by getting them used to the horse walker if they'd just come out of the field, which only probably take a couple of days. Um, and then we would put tack on them. We'd put um, side reins, a standing martingale. Uh, the side reins stop the head going down. The standing martingale stops the head coming up. Um, and then we'd, we'd, we'd obviously put the saddle on at the same time in the horse walker because then that holds the, the, the bottom of the, both the martingales. And we'd walk round, the, walk round with them a couple of times in the horse walker, tighten their girth up and then let them loose. They might have a little play for five minutes. They'd get, soon get very, very used to having the tack on, the braking tack, that is. Um, and then we would take them off the horse walker after 20, 25 minutes once they've taken the steam out of them um, and take them into the lunge pit. We don't do a lot of lunging, um, but we, would, we, we do drive them a lot on two reins. So we do a little bit of lunging with two reins, one behind them and one from the front, and then get them going clockwise and anti-clockwise. Do a little bit of that and then, then do quite a bit of driving with them. Um, it wouldn't take as many days before we start to jump on their back, as long as the horse has got confidence um, and they're, they're handling everything that you're doing with them fine. So maybe some horses, you're probably on the back after a week or something like that. What's the timeline of a young horse arriving at the yard and, and then before maybe they're a judge to, to be a breeze up horse, maybe they're a judge to have a little bit more time? Well, if people send a breeze up horse, you try and get them to the sales. It's as simple as that. Um, you don't necessarily push them, but uh, if they're not going to be ready for the earlier ones, you just enter them for a late one and hope that they come right for you. It's a frenetic period that breeds up sale. There's sale after sale after sale pushed into not a, a massive amount of time in the grand scheme of things. When do things really start ramping up for you in the year? Uh, probably, probably six weeks prior, we start to do a bit more with them. Um, basically, they're just doing a normal canter most days. Um, and then probably six weeks prior, if the ground's good, we'll go on the grass more often than the all weather. Um, and they're on, they're on a considerable amount of food, so you just have to make sure that you're going to keep their heads right, that they're not buzzed up and they're not too fresh. So to, to do that, we'll do two canters three times a week just to keep the edge off them. We do very little galloping, um, probably take them away a couple of times just to see how green they are off of the place. Um, and, I, and I assume most of the other boys do very similar. At one stage... There was the perception that horses were doing too much because timing came in, but that's all drifted away. They don't do too much. Um, people look after their horses very well. They want to get them to the sales in one piece. Timing is an indication, but it's not the be-all and end-all at the breeze-ups. Um, people use it as a guidance. Uh, stride pattern's quite important, a, a nice moving colt. Um, so th there's a number of things, but we, we start to do a little bit more with them probably six weeks off the sales. Is timing something that you'd use in the, in the build-up to it, or is, is the time that they actually get on the day, it, that's more of a surprise? Um, <laughs> never do timing at home. We, we, don't, we don't go very quick with them. An odd, odd day we'll let them run along, but basically we do a lot of base work. By going quick them doesn't make the horses any quicker at all. Probably takes some of the greenness out of them. But no, we'd never time at home. Um, it's interesting, the timing at the sales, because it is used as a factor in people purchasing some of the horses, not all of them, but it is, is a factor. Um, and there's no good, it's no good saying that um, timing is not important and you're not going to train them up to a certain level. 
because otherwise you'll be, end up being a dead hero and that's no good to anybody. So you have to do a little bit more with them, but uh, not a lot more. Is there a different type of horse now that you might see at the Breeze Ups that, that you wouldn't have seen maybe 10, 15 years ago? Um, not really. Uh, p possibly they've gone a little bit more, some of the sales have gone a little bit more towards the earlier two-year-old types. Maybe 15 years ago you could breeze the horses in pairs um, and the more backward horse would help them along. It's not for he every horse to come up on their own now, you know. So um, some of the horses are probably maybe a little bit sharper now. Generally when your average racing fan hears breeze up sale, the, the first type of horse they think of is precocious, speedy two-year-old who's going to be ready to go. But that's not always the case, is it? Most certainly not, no. Um, absolutely not, no. There's different types of horses. You know, that's why it's, for me it's difficult for people to assess the times because if they're all the same type of two-year-old sharp horse, then times might mean, mean a little bit more. But if you've got a mid-season or, or a back-end two-year-old that's going to make a nice quality three-year-old, um, you know, they're not going to do a time. You know, I've had a few horses do horrendously slow times that have turned out being very good. You've had plenty of success over the years with them. You have a great eye, at w maybe, at working out exactly which stallions might be able to thrive throughout the breeze up sale. Is there a particular name that stands out for this year? Obviously, I've got a soft spot for Too Darn Hot, um, but I've got quite a few of them on the property and we've got enough of them to make a fair assessment and they look way above average. But tell me exactly why Too Darn Hot is standing out at the moment. What are you seeing that the rest of us, well, I haven't been privy to see? I might be looking through rose-tinted glasses because we had him <laughs> here. They're just quality horses with very genuine, very generous in their work without being hot. They have nice actions. They look to have pace. Um, you know, they're bred to be seven furlongs to possibly a mile and a quarter horses. And um, we've, we've got some other very nice first season stallions. Blue Point, we had a very nice Inns of Court Colt. He, he was a cracker. Uh, Le Bravido, uh, Land Force. We, we've had three or four nice Land Forces, you know. So. It's difficult to say, but we've got more two darn hots and, and, and they look fairly, fairly above average to me. Is there an advantage to buying a breeze up horse rather than going through a conventional route of, say, a yearling sale or potentially even buying further down the line? Yes and no. There's, there's, there's plenty of pluses, very few minuses. Um, you can, people prefer, the trainers prefer to buy the yearlings because they know what they're going to have in the yard. They know how they're prepared um, if they have them in themselves and break them or if they go to their pre-trainers, they know what they're having done with them, they know what their daily routine is. So they probably feel a bit more comfortable about that. But uh, breeze ups, you, you're a little bit down the line and you can see if they move well, you can see if they're clean and they're sound. Um, and then it's if you like the pedigree, the confirmation, there's a massive amount of pluses to it. A lot of very good horses come out of it. What's your favourite part of the process? You've been at this a, a long while at this point. What, what keeps you going? Uh, oh, I don't know what keeps me going. <laughs> <laughs> um, I enjoy the sales. Um, I enjoy the breaking in. I enjoy the getting them ready. I enjoy selling them. And then before you get them sold, you're looking on to the next, you know, what you're thinking about next year. I enjoy it all, as do most of the people that do it, you know. Is there a moment that stands out over the 30 years, a particular horse that you look back on with a, a lot of pride that has gone on through the breeze ups to, to a big success? Oh, a horse that got me going for a start, um, Osa Risky, uh, did exceptionally well for me. He was, he, he was slightly, well, I would say he was wild. Um, and Jimmy Guest, who's a brilliant rider, uh, rode him most days. I think I rode him one day and he frightened the life out of me. Um, but I, I bought him for... Eight thousand pounds, and I sold him to David Ellsworth for thirty, and uh, which was a lot of money going back then. He he won over a quarter of a million group races. Um, he was second in the Champion Hurdle. He won the Triumph. He was a very very good horse. So he got me going. While your eye needs to be impeccable for the, for this kind of business, the team around you has to be just as good and you have to have a lot of faith in them with these horses taking their first steps towards their careers absolutely absolutely because they can easily get ruined so 
Yeah, you've just got to be patient, treat them with kindness. Even if they're naughty, there's only one way to beat them and that's with kindness. Um, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So you just take your time with them. But no, I've got a very, very good team of people around me. I think generally when you think of, say, a human in their formative years, if you make mistakes with them, then it can have a, a real knock-on effect going forward. Is that the same with horses and is it maybe even more elevated? I don't know if it's more elevated, but you, they, they need a nice, quiet, um, sensible grounding to get some manners on them. Um, and it's nice to have horses that enjoy work um, without overdoing them. I, I, I suppose you can compare them with people, yeah. You know, they don't want to be too fresh, otherwise they get into naughty habits. You need to be doing just enough so they're not too far forward, but you're taking the edge off them so they're not messing around. What haven't you achieved in this game that you'd like to? There's been plenty of success along the way, but is there anything that stands out? I just, I just like people doing well with the horses after we've had them, you know. Um, I'm pretty under the radar for myself. I just tick away quietly, but I, I like people to do very well with the horses that have been through our hands. You know, whether they're pre-trainers or whether they're horses we've bought and sold on, um, I just want people to do well afterwards. Is there a time when you can actually stop? Because it, it seems like an all-encompassing, near-on 24-hour business. If you're not looking at your horses for going to the breeze-ups or pre-training, you must be looking at results and wondering how exactly the next generation are going to come about. I think, I think anybody who does well with the horses, it's, it's their life and it's 24-7. Um, and uh, it's something that you're used to. It's as simple as that. So uh, it's not quite my hobby, but it's a passion. Um, and, and that's why most people do it. So from Malcolm Bastard with 30 years of experience under his belt, we've now headed to the opposite end of the scale to meet with Ellie Whitaker and Tegan Clark, who formed Whitaker Clark Equine. They've only had a few years in this business, but results have been immediate. I started with Dali uh, Godolphin pre-training. Um, we spent a year and a half there, to then to be dispersed up to Charlie Atherley's yard. And at that time at Godolphin, they, it wasn't just a strong team of horses as a whole. The juveniles in particular were flying. Notable names were, were just flying out left, right and centre. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was a serious year. I mean, it was the year of when I was there. Was Massar won the derby. Uh, Lana Duty won the juvenile turf. Um, obviously, had coming up on the ranks of the, the breaking process. You know, Pinatubo was in in, in amongst them, um, and it really was. It was exciting. All the I, I was a very small part of that. I, you know, I'm not going to say I, I rode Massar, but um, you know, to, to be amongst that atmosphere and, and within a team like that, it was it was stuff of dreams, really. You know, you you, you wake up. At, especially in the racing industry and in, uh, Godolphin's, you know, the be all and end all, it's, it's the place to be. Um, the pedigree, the facilities, the horses, you know, the, the trainer alone, jeez. So if you're in a Premier League level stable or multiple stables uh, across your experience in the industry, why start out now in this new venture? I've always, from a child, um, always wanted my own yard, whether that be um, 20 cobs or 30 eventers, you know, it had to be horses. Um, I grew up with them and being able to wake up in the morning to go out to feed my horses, it, it just really appealed to me. And it's a dream that, like I say, before I could walk, that's, that's what I wanted to do. So it didn't matter what discipline, it just needed to happen. <laughs> And always going to be part of a partnership, or did you did you see initially that you would have your name on, in lights and it would be your solitary thing? Probably uh, being a young child, I mean, the dream was to be an international event rider, five star, you know, advance. Um, so probably as a child, it was more I want this and I'm going to get this, and if I work hard enough, um, I'll make it happen. But me and Tegan, you know, we discussed it sort of happened quite quickly um, but it's something since the day that we met we have discussed and who better to go into business with you know we, we, we work very well together although we are very different we have our differences um, and we make that very clear but in everyday work you know we, th we thrive off each other we work and, and if I'm sort of if I'm lacking 
she's there to pick me up and, and vice versa. Sort of applied for a job with Roger Verin at the time. He um, had just taken on Sheikh Abade. Uh, so he had uh, quite a big influx of horses and um, some really lovely horses. Uh, we had, that was the year we had postponed, um, which was just, you know, it's unreal to be a part of a team that's got a horse like that, that's just producing these group one races. It's, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a mega year. Um, a lot of hard work, uh, a huge adjustment coming from a small team, um, sort of in the countryside, uh, on our own private gallops to just this hustle and bustle of th thousands of horses out every morning and, uh, you know, yeah, managing a bigger team and, uh, but no, it was a, it was a fantastic year and sort of learnt, learnt a lot. And, and moving to Roger gave you added responsibility as well. You were able to travel with that. Um, I didn't travel so much with Roger. I started, uh, I did a bit of traveling with him. I was with Ollie. We took a filly out to America. Um, she had won the Group 1 Elsa Bardis at Keeneland the year before. We took her back for a second campaign um, for the Oaks. Unfortunately, she was a runner up and didn't quite get in. But, you know, she had a few spins out there, which was, again, an unbelievable experience. Uh, definitely learned to ride a lot better. Um, it's a lot tougher out there, um, but that was fantastic. And then you know, I was pretty much based at home when I was at Rogers. And then I sort of spent a bit of time back home in South Africa, um, riding out there in Cape Town and Milton um, for a trainer called Dean Kenemer. Um, and came, then came back to Newmarket uh, in, the, in the summer and started working for Simon Crisford. And uh, that's where I sort of headed off to Dubai with a couple of horses for him, um, which is, again, you, you know, these, ex these experiences constantly teach you. So uh, I was very thankful for that. We started with one horse, so you can imagine we're, we're paying for 15 stables and there's, there's nothing coming in and there's nothing going out. Um, Kevin Philippard de Foy actually sent the first horse and it, it enabled us to have or create some sort of social media. So, you know, Twitter, Instagram are mainly the platforms that we use and advertising or just, you know, this stories, people see them and, and whether it be five seconds or, or half an hour that they're on their phone, you know, they're still going to see them. So it really has, it's been a crucial part of our business and, and will continue to be. What, what about the, the pre-training and, and breeze up sides of the industry appeals to you most? Um, the pre-training for me, it's it's a very rewarding job, although tough. Um, but seeing the horses progress from the moment they come in, you know whether that be their their behaviour, their their mannerisms, or, or you know essentially you're the first ones to do anything with these horses. And our job, like I said, it's very rewarding, and 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 to see them progress and go onto the track, they might. It might not have any success on the track, but it's still that process that you've managed to get them there. And, you know, it's a big part of it. It's a big part of, of being able to, you know, the, especially the homebreds, they come in feral, <laughs> never touched, you know, they don't know what a hoof pick is. So working and educating them, it, it really is. It, it's, it, it feels a part, of, a part of home, really. You're buying a lot more expensive horses, um, and obviously dealing with younger horses um, and sort of having to, t sort of breaking them in and, and teaching them a totally different sort of discipline. But I think, you know, being able to ride, ride the race horses and, and getting them through the gallops and, and getting them fit and taking them away for race course gallops, uh, you know, that brings a much bigger element, a lot more adrenaline and um, yeah, a lot more exciting. And, and then sort of cheering them home um, you know, you can definitely pick their little faces out, and even on a small screen. You know, when you know them inside and out, you can you can see them. And having worked in yards, you you've been able to see the benefit of horses who have been pre-trained coming into it. What have you been able to take from racing yards as a whole that you can implement into this venture? I think um, routine structure of a yard. Um, it's it's very different, you know especially with the youngsters, we try and spend as much time with them as possible. 
in a training yard, you know, you have your lots, you have to get them out. You know, if one horse takes two hours, then one horse takes two hours. We'll, we'll be there with it as, for as long as we need. In terms of them training upsides, it's crucial that we get them to the point that they can go upsides. The dummy stalls, if you can see behind us, you know, that's always something that we, we long rein through there. Um, in terms of training, it's tough, it's difficult, you know, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's two very different things. And although there's similarities in, in terms of the way that you train and you're going up a canter, it's still very much different. So implementing, there are day-to-day -day things that you would, like putting them on the walker and things like that, but we try, we try our utmost to do it differently and, and have a different routine for these animals. It's a long life if they're doing the same thing every day. <laughs> we kind of had the same ideas and I think through meeting, meeting Ellie that really pushed me to sort of take the bull by the horns. Um, I probably would never have done it on my own, um, although always having the dream to do it. What we want at the end of the day in terms of how our horses go and how they look and how they're going to breeze or how they're going to go into training and, and be with a trainer is very similar but it definitely helps um, having someone who's a bit stronger or somebody who's a bit more relaxed and it, it, you know, it helps with riding the horses and you know, they're all different temperaments as well. I don't necessarily get on with all of them and, and vice versa but one of us will. Um, so no, it's, uh, it definitely, definitely helps. And especially worthwhile when almost instant success comes in a filly called Royal Acclaim was in your care. You know, we knew we had a nice filly and she, she sort of, the day we took her to the sales, she couldn't have been in, in a better place. Um, you sort of, I always say, I remember standing at the top of the Royal Mile there, watching them breeze and watching her through the binoculars and then sort of putting the binoculars down and going, geez, that looks, that looks pretty quick. Um, which was, we, we expected her to go there and have a lovely straight, good breeze, but to be, the times that she put in you know that was just an absolute bonus um, and then it sort of just really ramped up when she went up and won first time out and sort of beat those you know she beat perfect power in her, in her first race and uh, a lovely cult of Ed Battles that you know won a group three after that and you know so it really ramped us up um, and got us got us out there. So it, looking back on it, it it doesn't seem real because because we're working so hard you don't get the time to sort of take a breath and go, wow, that just happened. And Royal Acclaim has breezed by them, takes the lead with a furlong and a half to go, and Royal Acclaim is now putting distance between herself and her rivals. She's clear now by three lengths. Mondamej and McInara staying on, but Royal Acclaim is the real deal. Three out of three, Royal Acclaim. We still pinch ourselves today, and like I said to you, we, you know, it's nearly unbelievable. Um, to have a first season like that. Um, again, I do believe it's a lot of hard work, consistency, and just putting in the hours. You know, horses aren't easy, and it's not for the faint-hearted, um, but you feed them at the same time in the morning, you get on your first lot, you do it day in, day out, something will pay off, the hard work will pay off, and the time that you put into it, it's like anything. You know, if, if you really believe in it, you, 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 you know, you'll, you'll reap the reward. We don't want to be a massive operation. I quite like the idea of sticking to a smaller number where we can still give our sort of individual attention uh, to each animal. Um, but yeah, I think that's just the goal at the moment is just to keep going through the motions and, and keep having the success that we can and inevitably sort of buy a nice place that we can really call our own. So that's it for the latest edition of This Racing Live. Thanks to everyone who opened their doors to us this week. Thanks to you for watching. And next week, it'll be more Newmarket with the Craven Breeze Ups. Bye-bye. Subscribe to Racing TV's YouTube channel now to watch more great races like this.